The peculiar advantage of aircraft rockets is that they are relatively large self-propelled missiles, exerting no recoil forces on their launchers. They have a greater penetration than small cannon or general purpose bombs, and greater accuracy than bombs. I was very well impressed with uh, NOTS because it carried the wartime spirit forward. See, during World War II, we were gung-ho to accomplish. And the government gave us the freedom to accomplish. And we did accomplish. And now, the rocket racket. Rockets were the primary reason that the China Lake Laboratory was brought into being in November of 1943. Those rockets were one aspect of the secret weapon war that included technological marvels such as radar, sonar, proximity fuses, rudimentary guided missiles, and the most deadly secret of all, the atomic bomb. During the war, the station's military and academic leaders developed a relationship, a community literally, that focused on the fleet and was supported by the Bureau. China Lake also began to develop the programmatic breadth and depth that would mark it as unique among laboratories, to say nothing of military establishments. That operational technical team created an activity with the unique capability to respond, and respond fast to operational requirements. The superb cooperation between the lab and the fleet, between the engineer and operator, designer and machinist, planner and pilot, would allow the station to respond with more than rockets. By some lights, everything that has flowed from the China Lake labs and shops and ranges in the post-war decades descends from those first Caltech Navy rockets. There's truth to that. The descendants of the station's earliest endeavors branch out from the wartime rocket program into every sort of guided missile and every sort of free-fall bomb, into bomb directors and fire control, and into both the tech base and the T&E establishment to support them all. The station's emergence from the post-war institutional austerity with an expanding program, an expanding physical plant, and an expanding population of scientists and specialists was epitomized by the opening in 1948 of massive modern Michelson Laboratory, a state-of-the-art facility with fewer offices than research labs and specialized shops occupying its 10-plus acres. With a full-scale laboratory available, physicists, chemists, engineers, draftsmen and model makers, with shops and test chambers and vast ranges right next door, with airplanes, pilots and orties available on the spot, the station could and would follow wherever technology allowed and wherever the fleet demanded. and the station would lead the technological charge in many areas with basic and applied research and with studies and analyses of threats and requirements and a world of possibilities. War in Korea in 1950 created the stage on which to show just what such a full-spectrum laboratory could do under the gun, as it were. When monstrous Soviet tanks entered the fray, China Lake responded with Project Ram, the China Lake team designed, developed, tested, documented, and built the pilot production rounds of the 6.5-inch tank-killing rocket that were delivered to the operators in Korea in just 28 days. China Lake had begun the post-war era with a startling array of new rockets already in the works for barrage and bombardment and breaching, for attacking tanks, trucks, and trains, and submarines, too, and the directed evolution of those weapons was fast and furious throughout the 50s. One family of follow-ons would acquire folding fins, disposable pod launchers, and an amazing array of warheads. And the station was creating internal carriage schemes long before anyone ever heard of stealth.
The sub-hunting branch that started with retro rockets and hedgehogs created the oddly configured Weapon A and evolved through RAT and ASROC and on into today's VLA. From every aspect of the rocket racket arose some other. Guided missiles, obviously, once the guidance was placed atop the rocket, plus all the components thereof, sensors and seekers, servos and steering fins, fuses and initiators, and the avionics, too, before the term was coined, for the missile and for the airplane, and for the missile to talk to the airplane, and vice versa. Advanced fire control came from the lab's pursuit of accuracy, against bunkers and against bombers. The new generation of folding fin rockets was designed for air-to-air, -air, since guided missiles were a generally unreliable lot, at least until Sidewinder came along. And Sidewinder itself was built upon the tried-and-true 5-inch rocket and its in-house developed and proven technologies. Accuracy was a prime motive of the laboratory. Even a near-miss with an unguided rocket fired from a moving airplane against a moving target on the ground or in the air was no mean feat. Try throwing a rock out the window of your car doing 90 down a washboarded dirt road to hit the jackrabbit crossing that road at an increasingly oblique angle. Better do your math fast. They did it on slide rules, supplemented by a heavy metal battery of clattering electromechanical Marchants and Monroes and Friedmans. And they developed advanced computing techniques as computing machines evolved. And they applied those new machines and their programs, analogs first, then the revolutionary digitals, and even strange hybrids, to every problem in the arsenal. From modified machine gun sites hastily adapted to the needs of rockets, came the progenitors of China Lake's aircraft fire control systems. These began as electromechanical integrators, gears, levers, the occasional vacuum tube, and became the complex, precise, multi-technological wonders from which directly descend today's weapon integration and software support activities for digital-driven airplanes that literally cannot fly without massive computing power. And, of course, Sidewinder is in that lineage, too. The placing of the fire control system into the rocket spawned its first incarnation, the so-called heat-homing rocket, the moniker designed to hide the guided missile from a bureaucracy that had officially removed that area of endeavor from the station's mission. The station pioneered simulation techniques as well, in hardware and in software. At China Lake, real rockets rode rails, flying in simulated free space. Model rockets flew free through real space. And soon enough, virtual rockets flew through virtual space. Countermeasures and counter-countermeasures too stemmed from these efforts. China Lake even countermeasured its own weapons in advance of their usurpation by highly adaptable enemies. The lab created specialized pyrotechnics and the methods for their delivery, and their formulation and production and use, whether to deceive an opponent's sensors, or to deceive Mother Nature and bust a hurricane, or break a drought. The needs of the fleet pressed the station to pursue R&D in related fields. The airframes and the fins and the control surfaces. The warheads and the motors. With the explosives and propellants to fill them. The fuses and igniters and initiators and safe arm devices for those too. And, branching off its early pilot plant initiatives, the methods for the scale up of the energetics for all of that. And the machining and the casting and production and packaging as well. That expertise in energetics would lead the station into projects both massive and subtle, from strategic missile motors to aircraft ejection systems, and even swimmer weapons. During the deepening Cold War, China Lakers would expand upon their conventional weapons expertise to ensure that the Navy would also have modern weapons that didn't have nuclear warheads. Before the Atom Mad 50s were over, the station would embark on a program to create an entirely new family of modern conventional weapons, the I-Series, deliverable from nearly any aircraft for terrain denial, direct attack, and deterrence. By the late 1950s, station facilities could support nearly anything the China Lake Wizards could come up with, even new rockets. China Lake's vast and varied ranges began with a quickly bulldozed firing line for the early Caltech rockets. Ranges soon followed to support some of the Navy's earliest guided missiles, which were problematic to test on the already cramped East Coast ranges. But the new station had room.
The simple ranges of World War II evolved fast, and T&E facilities for the firing of rockets and torpedoes and both air and surface launch missiles blossomed. Air and ground and undersea ranges. Live fire arenas. Target complexes. Huge towers for fuse tests. An array of specialized test and research tracks. And strange things ran down those tracks to fire crosswise into the wind catch atomic artillery shells in mid-flight. Stage an emergency ejection at high speed. And figure out just what happens to missile radomes in a rainstorm at Mach Plus. And for decades, bombs and missiles and ejection seats and things even more arcane rode the rails pushed by leftover HVARs and tiny tins. Environmental and safety and non-destructive evaluation facilities were designed, building on the lessons of the rocket programs. Foundations were laid, too, to support new technologies that would soon be brought to the fore by the new realities of a new sort of war. The labs and ranges were already being envisioned to create the things that hovered on the fringes of the imagination at the time. VTOL airplanes and night vision devices, software-driven weapon systems, ramjet-powered, multi-mode-guided, satellite-linked automatons. The station's early involvement with the application of the atom came back around, too, during the atomic-obsessed Cold War decades, as China Lake applied nuclear spearheads to some of its rockets. The station did not handle the warheads, but in great secrecy, the laboratory created bore to be launched from aircraft, and big stoop from the ground and marlin from beneath the surface of the sea. And ultimately, China Lake's vast rocket expertise was called in to help create what would become Polaris. The station's broad abilities and experience base allowed it to conduct the targeting studies and the applications of emerging and projected technologies to an ongoing development program, ultimately shaping the nation's submarine launch strategic deterrent system. The legacy of those first rockets those seemingly simple secret weapons of another era was a technical program so broad, so diverse, and so sweeping as to take the station in less than two decades since its founding, from the very depths of the ocean to the fringes of outer space. A technical program that would not only help provide the deterrent weapons for the Cold War, but that would also provide the new generation of weapons, the dumb, the smart, and the sneaky, for the coming decades. But that's another story. In December 1943, the Navy Department directed the establishment of the United States Naval Ordnance Test Station in Yukon. In addition to its primary function as an ordnance testing center, the station was also directed to conduct a program of research leading to new and better ordnance materiel. To carry out the mission of the station, construction of a great new laboratory was started in 1944. Michelson Laboratory was dedicated in May 1948 and took its place as one of the largest and foremost facilities for scientific research in the country. Nine and one-half acres of floor space are enclosed in its reinforced concrete walls. Functionally modern in design, it fits admirably into the Mojave Desert environment. 
The offices, laboratories, and shops are cooled in summer by 1,280 tons of refrigeration. Heated in winter by a plant that supplies nearly 26 million BTU per hour. Earthquake proof as modern architectural engineering can make it, the building is really 16 separate structures. Six one-story wings join the main hall building whose 800-foot roof is as large as the deck of an aircraft carrier. There is also a three-story shop wing housing an all-weather laboratory, materials testing laboratory, and the main machine shop. From the administrative offices along the main hall, the rocket and explosives department, test department, aviation ordnance department, research department, and design and production department direct the scientific staff, integrating them into a closely knit team. Fittingly named for Dr. Albert Abraham Michelson, one of the country's foremost scientists, this great laboratory is imbued with the spirit and tradition of his work. Here a room has been dedicated to the memoirs of his accomplishments. A beautiful display of medals and awards, including the first Nobel medal and scroll in physics to be awarded to an American scientist. Here also is a model of the ether drift experiment. The apparatus he used to measure the speed of light an harmonic analyzer that can either analyze complex waveforms or produce them. And a working model of one of his ruling engines. These and other exhibits serve as a constant reminder of the tradition inherited by the laboratory from its namesake, Dr. Michelson. No short picture can tell the complete story of Michelson Laboratory, but a quick look at a few of the projects will convey an idea of the variety of work in progress. The Aviation Ordnance Department has developed this electronic analog computer to help solve the many problems encountered in designing aircraft fire control systems. Various constants in the form of electrical components can be set up so that they represent the mathematical values which describe the equations of motion of an aircraft and its missile in actual flight. Variables are set in by motor control potentiometers. Then, while the operator flies the simulated plane, results are plotted automatically on a continuous recorder for later assessment and analysis. The ballistics division is concerned with many problems of exterior ballistics and aerodynamics of missile design. This model of a new aeroballistics laboratory with its multiple camera stations so placed as to completely cover a 500-foot trajectory with high-order precision. It's flashing Edgerton lights, electronically controlled to a millionth of a second. A newly developed special purpose camera will permit determination of the position of a missile in space to one one thousandth of a foot. The electronic laboratories and shops develop and build a wide variety of timing, coding, and counting instruments. The engineers are aided by competent electronic technicians working in well-equipped shops. Designs are brought from the breadboard stage through experimental chassis to the finished prototype models before turning them over to commercial manufacturers. An important development of the electronic development branch has been these plug-in units which combine all the circuit components for one tube into a convenient, rapidly replaceable unit. Blinking lights, lights controlled to a millionth of a second. This is the province of the physics division. Kersell development has made possible the measurement of transient phenomena far too fast for the eye to resolve. This camera, equipped with three electro-optical Kersell shutters, is capable of taking three accurately time-space exposures, each of one one hundred millionth of a second duration. The schematic diagram shows how the light from the three shutters passes through a single lens and is recorded on a single graphic film. Interferometry is an important science in the hands of the Applied Science Division. Their Mach Zender interferometer is used to analyze the density of flowing gases. This large instrument is used in research on factors needed in the design of rocket nozzles. The right-hand record shows the gas at rest, while the left shows the distortion of the interference pattern due to the flow of gas. At the other end of the size scale is this Michelson interferometer, equipped with a mirror mounted on a diaphragm. The displacement of the mirror causes a change in the interference pattern, which, when recorded on moving film, gives a true pressure time record. 
The instrument is extremely sensitive and can also be used as a strain gauge. The chemistry division occupies 28,000 square feet of laboratory space. The facilities embrace the fields of organic, inorganic, analytical, and physical chemistry. They are divided into individual laboratories, each specifically equipped for the type of problem under investigation. Emphasis is placed on propellant and explosives research. Many testing devices like this precision high pressure calorimeter have been designed and built by the division. The calorimeter is used to measure the energy of minute quantities of explosive compounds. The results are recorded on tape as a permanent record. This ignition delay apparatus for determining the time required for liquid fuels to ignite is another locally designed facility. The oxidizer and the fuel are injected into the transparent combustion chamber and results are recorded and timed with a high-speed camera. The ballistic mortar, one of only a half dozen such instruments in the country, is housed to the rear of the main laboratory building. It is used to measure the energy of appreciable charges of explosives that have reached the pilot production stage or to test commercial products under consideration for ordnance applications. Results are determined by registering the magnitude of the pendulum swing. The efficiency of the modern laboratories and highly trained personnel of the chemistry division is augmented by a complete glass blowing shop for fabrication of apparatus and a model shop in charge of a laboratory mechanic where special equipment can be made. The specialized laboratories and shops are complemented by a complete set of service facilities that make Michelson Laboratory nearly self-sufficient as a scientific research organization. The optics shop can shape and surface glass up to 40 inches in diameter. It has a wide variety of grinding, polishing, and testing equipment, including a precision optical bench for the precise testing and evaluating of optical components. The machine shop is 420 feet long and three stories high. It contains a variety of equipment for all types of metal working and fabricating. It is augmented by a complete heat treating plant. There are machines for every size, large planers, lathes, and boring mills that are capable of handling the heaviest type of work. And watchmaker's equipment for the smallest work, the shop's design stresses versatility. A complete photographic laboratory includes facility for both black and white and color photography. Its modern semi-automatic finishing equipment handles thousands of negatives and prints each month. Complete machine processing for motion picture and special wide films make this type of record available in a short time after range tests are complete. To expedite the reading and assessment of thousands of photographic records, the assessment branch has many time-saving devices. One is this shaft rotation converter, which measures coordinates on camera records. As the crank is turned, a photoelectric cell registers each five thousandth of an inch. The impulse from the photocell is counted by an electronic binary counter, and the results are fed into an automatic card punching machine, which records the data on a card for tabulation by automatic computing machines. With its basic creed derived in the scientific tradition of its namesake, Dr. Michelson, the personnel working in this great modern laboratory are continuing to seek better methods and equipment with which to keep the United States and its armed forces in the forefront of ordnance development. The laboratory's future and the future of the scientists, engineers, and technicians that man its facilities have been and always will be inspired by the achievements of those who use the facilities of the Naval Ordnance Test Station to develop the many rockets and weapons so successfully employed in the past and which are exemplified by this partial display. The big 11 and 3 quarters inch Tiny Tim, the 5 inch Holy Moses, the 2 and 3 quarters inch Mighty Mouse, Finners, Spinners and Practice Rounds. All of these and more are now or have been service weapons of which the station can be justly proud. But they are just the forerunners of still better weapons to come. New and improved rockets, guided missiles, underwater ordnance, fire control systems, and the countless accessory items 
that make their field use possible are being developed and tested now. And Michelson Laboratory, truly one of the great research centers in the United States, is a vital part of this important preparedness program. <laughs> During World War II, one of the few facilities available for development work on underwater missiles was the fixed angle launcher, located at the Morris Dam torpedo ranges. This launcher fired missiles by compressed air and proved valuable in tests of aircraft torpedoes. However, since the water entry angle of a missile affects its underwater performance, the fixed angle launcher was seriously limited in its use. Engineers in the newly formed Underwater Ordnance Department realized the need for a new kind of launcher, one which could fire many types of air-to-water missiles from a variety of firing angles at velocities up to supersonic, a facility which could fully document the progress of these missiles from launcher through water entry and underwater travel. The design conceived for the proposed variable angle launcher called for two barges to be spanned by a 95-foot bridge which would support the water end of a launching bridge. The launching bridge was designed for possible installation of as many as six 300-foot launching tubes varying in diameter from 12 to 48 inches. The upper end of the bridge would rest on a movable carriage. On the opposite side of the launching bridge, a counterweight car would balance the launcher and carriage. To adjust the launching angle between zero and 40 degrees, a motor drive was to be constructed which would act on the 16 2 and 1 8 inch cables connecting the carriage and counterweight car. Plans also called for a well-instrumented range consisting of three general side view cameras placed at intervals parallel to the 1,000-yard range, a movable camera car, two rear-view cameras, and an overhead camera. In addition, 24 hydrophones, or underwater microphones, would record the missile's underwater travel. Construction of the variable angle launcher was started in early 1946 the launcher site selected was a slope on the south side of the Morris Dam Peninsula, naturally inclined at a 45-degree angle. 
Clearance of the entire site was rapidly undertaken, and soon the steel reinforced concrete ramps which would support the launcher carriage on one side and the counterweight car on the other were underway. Over 40,000 sacks of cement were used in the grouting operation to stabilize the underlying rock and 2,000 yards of concrete were poured to make the four-foot thick launcher slab. While the slab was being prepared, the 35 by 60 by 12 foot special pontoons which would support the water end of the launching bridge were brought in over the winding mountain roads to the dam. Upstream from the launching site, the pontoons were joined by an all-welded connecting bridge which would ultimately support the water end of the launcher. Once the slab was prepared, the rails for the carriage were laid. These rails are about 10 times the weight of standard mainline railroad track, weighing 1,200 pounds per yard. As construction of the south slope progressed, the opposite slope of the launcher was being prepared. Rails to support the counterweight car were a standard heavy rail section. The counterweight car, which rides on 10 pair of railroad wheels, was made with a steel frame and reinforced concrete body acting together structurally as a composite member. Its 500 ton weight was obtained by incorporating steel punchings and other scrap in the concrete in place of rock aggregate and by filling the car compartments with pig iron. The carriage, which supports the inner end of the launching bridge, was floated to the launching site and hoisted to the rails of the slope where seven inch pins pushed through holes in the rails and the carriage base held the carriage securely. One of the biggest jobs to accomplish was the assembly of the 300 foot long bridge, the longest all welded bridge ever constructed in the United States. The bridge, the 22 and a half inch tube, and the tank to provide high pressure air for launching missiles were assembled upstream at a convenient level assembly area on the shore of the lake. The lake level was brought up to transfer the bridge load from the assembly area to the pontoons, and then, supported partially by the pontoons and partially by a barge, the bridge was floated downstream to the launcher site where it was accurately positioned over the carriage. The lake was then lowered until a large pivot pin under the bridge engaged in the carriage. The launching tube is supported at 25 foot intervals by adjustable turnbuckles which permit its accurate alignment. Above the slopes and supporting the upper portion of the inclined tracks is a concrete cellular building with seven floor levels housing electronic control and recording equipment and other apparatus. To complete the VAL construction, the housing and the main drive machinery were raised to the top of the concrete structure. There, the 16 wire cables were laid over the three drum hoist and connected at either end to the launching bridge and the counterweight car. The variable angle launcher, including auxiliary equipment and instrumentation, was completed in May 1948 at a cost of approximately $2 million. After a brief dedication ceremony, the launcher was christened by a single firing of the torpedo Mark 13 from the 22 and a half inch launching tube. The need for a variable angle launcher had increased during the months of building. Thus, almost immediately following the dedication ceremony, the VAL was put to use. A typical test usually begins with adjustment of the launching angle. Movement shown here is about 50 times faster than normal. Once the launching angle is set, the work of preparing the instrumentation and the test missile begins. Personnel line up the flare and side view cameras in the camera car. The overhead camera is fed out on its cable until it is directly over the water entry point. Three general side view cameras along the west shore, a general rear view camera atop the concrete structure, and a rear view camera beneath the launcher muzzle give full above water camera coverage. Meanwhile, the missile to be launched is moved out of the nearby torpedo shop where it has been loaded with instruments for recording roll, pitch, 
and yaw of the missile during its run. The instrumented torpedo is brought to a projectile car which rides on rails adjacent to the launcher on the 45 degree slope. The car is raised or lowered to the level of the carriage platform where the missile is transferred to the deck. A three ton overhead crane is used to raise the missile from its dolly to the loading chute. The chute is then aligned with the launching tube and a hydraulically actuated ram pushes the missile into the launching tube. The range is clear. The arming plug is inserted. The control operator makes his final checks. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, fire. Let's take that again slowly. A tenth of a second after firing, compressed air rushes into the tube behind the torpedo, pushing the missile down the tube as electronic devices measure its velocity and acceleration. As soon as the missile leaves the tube, its behavior is recorded in many ways. Flares attached to the missile's tail make this pattern on film. Thus, the missile's speed, path, water entry deceleration, and whip can now be calculated. These pictures were taken by one of the three general side view cameras. This was taken by the water entry side view camera. This by the overhead camera. A picture from the rear view, and one from the tower showing the wake. A record is even made of underwater travel. By locating the holes in these nets, the first trajectory points are plotted. Those explosions are delay squibs set off in the head of the missile and picked up and amplified by hydrophones. A recording oscillograph in the concrete structure gives accurate data for plotting the missile's underwater path. Recent addition of another launching tube, 32 inches in diameter, has even increased the value of the VAL. Since completion in 1948, about 2,000 launchings have been made from the VAL, some at velocities exceeding 1,000 feet per second. Its versatility has affected great savings in time and cost in the development of torpedoes, rockets, depth charges, bombs, and mines. A tool of research, development, and test the variable angle launcher and its well-instrumented range has proved its value many times, serving a unique purpose by making possible better underwater weapons for the use of the Navy.
ASROC, one of the Navy's newest anti-submarine weapon systems, is capable of delivering either an acoustic homing torpedo or a depth charge to the area of an enemy submarine thousands of yards away. The missile, aimed by the shipboard fire control system, follows a ballistic trajectory, sheds its rocket motor at a predetermined signal, and its airframe shortly before water entry. When the payload is a torpedo, a parachute opens in flight to ease the weapon's entry into the water in the target area. When the payload is a depth charge, the firing sequence is the same, but the depth charge falls into the water without a parachute and sinks to a predetermined depth where it detonates with a large effective kill area. The ASROC weapon system consists of a detection apparatus, an electronic fire control computer, and eight missile launcher, the ASROC missile, and, of course, the ship. Early in the development stage, water entry tests of the ASROC payloads were made using the variable angle launcher at the station's Morris Dam torpedo ranges, not far from the Pasadena facility of the Naval Ordnance Test Station. Crosswind firing tests from a movable railroad flat car were conducted at the Naval Ordnance Test Station, China Lake, California. The Naval Ordnance Test Station has been the technical direction agency for the Bureau of Naval Weapons throughout the ASROC development program, which began in 1956. The Minneapolis Honeywell Regulator Company is the prime contractor. Many test firings from the ground ranges of the Knott's China Lake activity were required before shipboard evaluation could begin. In flight, a steel band holding the airframe together is severed by a small explosive charge on a signal from the missile's brain. The airframe peels off and drops into the sea, leaving the payload to continue its ballistic trajectory. Upon water entry, the torpedo is activated, locks onto its target, and pursues it to destruction. Here, the ASROC missile is being loaded onto its launcher at the Walker Lake facility in the confines of the Naval Ammunition Depot, Hawthorne, Nevada. The payload this time is a depth charge which falls freely into the water in the target area. In this sequence, the missile is being prepared for firing at the station San Clemente Island range off the coast of Southern California. After a last minute check, the thrust vent is removed, and ASROC is ready for firing. Missiles are usually loaded at dockside or at anchor, but the system can be replenished at sea, as the following scenes will demonstrate. The missile is shipped in a lightweight, airtight, watertight container, which has come to be called the coffin. It can be transferred at sea by normal Navy methods. The time required to transfer missiles from the supply ship to the firing ship and then into the launcher is short enough to indicate that this method of handling is practicable for fleet logistics. ASROC missiles can be treated as fixed ammunition. That is, they require no special handling nor checking out prior to loading and firing. The missiles go directly from their coffins to the launcher. The launcher, developed by the Universal Match Corporation, holds eight missiles in individual cells, each cell serving as missile stowage magazine and launcher. All eight cells turn together, and each pair of cells elevates individually. The launcher can cover almost a full circle about the ship while the ship remains on formation course. The missiles can be fired in succession at the throw of a switch. Launcher operation is fully automatic. 
The following scenes were taken during the shipboard evaluation of ASROC by the Bureau of Naval Weapons in waters off Key West, Florida. Prior to a firing, a helicopter was dispatched to observe the missile's water entry point. ASROC's sonar detection system finds and tracks enemy submarines by bouncing short bursts of sound off the target. These echoes are received and magnified aboard the attack ship to reveal target range and direction. The ASW officer monitors the attack solution and gives the command to fire. The long range of ASROC makes it possible for surface vessels to attack enemy submarines swiftly without the need to maneuver or leave a convoy. The submarine's commander is unaware that he is being attacked until the payload enters the water. ASROC, one of the Navy's newest answers to an enemy submarine threat, is another step towards security for the free world. This is what Conway Snyder of the Caltech Design Group exclaimed when he saw the first firing of the five-inch high-velocity aircraft rocket on the range of the U.S. Naval Ordnance Test Station. By this name, it was known throughout World War II. Holy Moses represented the coming of age of the air-to-ground warfare and was one of the most effective rockets in service use during World War II. The development of Holy Moses can be traced back to the popular 3.5-inch forward-firing rocket. This rocket, successfully used in anti-submarine warfare, had focused attention on the potential of air-launched rockets. And their performance suggested that they could be used effectively against other targets, where a high explosive head would be needed. A variant of the original 3.5-inch aircraft rocket was tried using a TNT-filled head. This proved to be unsatisfactory because of the small amount of explosive carried. The next step was to provide a larger head, which resulted in the development of a 5-inch aircraft rocket with a 3.5 motor, using an adaptation of the standard 5-inch anti-aircraft common shell. This rocket with the 5-inch head proved to be an effective new weapon, but due to added weight, there was a loss of velocity. A rocket was needed that combined both the speed of the 3.5 and the high explosive load of the 5-inch head. This led to the development of a highly effective rocket which utilized a larger motor, a high explosive load, and a greater speed than 3.5. Holy Moses. Although this high-velocity aircraft rocket, also known as HIVAR, was developed primarily for the Navy, an Army Air Force squadron was the first to use it in combat. It was proposed to the Army Air Force that the weapon be used against the numerous rocket launching sites that the Germans had built along the French coast. The Air Force accepted the proposal and the Navy gave full cooperation. In June of 1944, launchers were installed on the combat aircraft under the supervision of Caltech scientists. To initiate a training program, 100 rounds were shipped daily from Caltech to England. 
The 513th Fighter Squadron was the pioneer group, and when it was ready, the first combat action occurred in the Normandy invasion in the San Lo area. Later, support was given to General Patton's tank columns in the famous breakthrough at Coutances in the Brittany Peninsula, July 26, 1944. In both actions, the squadron chalked up a splendid record. In the invasion of southern France, Navy planes destroyed 487 Nazi vehicles and damaged more than 200 locomotives. From this impressive start in the European theater until VJ Day in the Pacific, Holy Moses was used in conjunction with other weapons. Navy flyers found the rocket very effective against point targets that required fortifications. It was used with great success throughout the Pacific. One task force commander commented, with the receipt of high velocity rockets of greater size, it is considered that rockets will become the primary offensive weapon in aircraft. Holy Moses was in development when the ranges were opened at the Naval Ordnance Test Station in early 1944. And in 1945, further development work on this and other rockets was transferred to Knott's from Caltech. Over 28 squadrons were trained at the station in the tactics and firing of the rocket before going overseas. Moses was one of the most potent weapons of the war. It was also the starting point for many significant post-war rocket programs at the U.S. Naval Ordnance Test Station. And this facility, now called the Naval Weapons Center, has become the largest research and development activity in the Navy. Sidewinder. High over the Sierra, near knots, a Navy pilot gets into position to fire one of the Navy's most effective air-to-air -air guided missiles. This is Sidewinder in action. Sidewinder, named for the Mojave rattlesnake, is the weapon that drove the Chinese Reds from the sky over Formosa. Sidewinder is the missile that homes in on infrared objects such as jet tailpipes and exhausts of propeller-driven aircraft. Flying on a pursuit course, the pilot fires Sidewinder, which constantly looks at the target and plans ahead to meet it on a collision course.
Sidewinder works well in the presence of other infrared sources, such as these clouds, as seen here in the background. Sidewinder is now being used by the Air Force and Navy and many NATO countries in defense of the free world. Advanced versions of Sidewinder are presently under development to give all weather capability and greatly extended range. RAPEC Rocket Assisted Personnel Ejection Catapult promises a safe way for pilots to escape from today's high speed jets at either high or low altitudes or while the jet is on the ground. Raypec, a small, powerful rocket attached to the back of the pilot's seat, propels the seat and the pilot approximately 250 feet, allowing the chute plenty of time to open. The most critical requirement of the ejection system is that it stay within the limits of human endurance. The human body can normally withstand 18 Gs of vertical acceleration for only a fraction of a second. RAPEC engineers solved this problem of human limits by dividing the rocket's flight into two phases. A booster to propel it from the plane, then a few milliseconds later, the sustainer phase drives it on up to a safe distance above the plane. To get the effect of being ejected from a jet at high speeds, the crew prepares another dummy for ejection. The test is covered with tape recorders, pen recorders, and high-speed cameras to catch every phase of it. Such tests as these have demonstrated that RAPEC may ensure a safe escape regardless of the altitude or speed. Charlie Range. Here, a Navy pilot roars down the flight line 50 feet off the ground in a bombing maneuver, which will allow him to enter enemy territory undetected, deliver a nuclear weapon, and escape. In a moment now, he will release a very small, white practice bomb. Bomb away. And it continues on up to 12,000 feet as he rolls his plane onto a course which will allow him to escape the bomb blast. The maneuver you just saw was developed at knots by VX-5. Working with Knotts as a team, they developed a program which is now used by all the armed services for their pilots. The sky screen timer, by looking at this graph made by these instruments, tells the pilots whether their practice maneuver was good enough to allow them to escape the bomb blast. An impact plotter locates the pilot's hit and tells him whether he hit the target or how far he missed it. The profile plotter makes a graphic profile of the pilot's maneuver over the flight line to see how far he might deviate from the ideal flight profile. He also records bomb impact and time of aircraft pull-up. All the information from the sky screen timer impact plotter and the profile plotter is relayed to the training officer who in turn calls the pilot and advises him of his error while he's getting into position for his next run. This quick service to the pilot is one of the unique features of Charlie Range. This way Charlie Range can take care of four or five pilots at the same time. a small group of men using the sky screen timer, the profile plotter, and the impact plotter are training Navy pilots so well 
they are able to destroy any target in the world. Polaris. Here off San Clemente Island is the Polaris pop-up testing site. Today the Navy is going to try fish hook, a new missile catching technique, which if it proves successful, will allow the same missile to be used over and over again in experimental work. Divers fasten the cable to the nose of the missile as it sits in its launcher more than 100 feet below the surface. The cable is secured and the divers clear the area in preparation for the launching. Back on the surface in the instrument barge, engineers prepare to record the pop-up test for future study. As the missile bursts from the launcher, arresting engines located under the deck of the fish hook rapidly take up the slack in the cable ahead of the missile so as to have the cable taut when the missile arrives at the top of its flight. This missile was undamaged and can be used for extensive test launchings. The fast action of the arresting engines in taking up the slack in the cable is seen here. Had there been any slack, the missile would have fallen back and snapped the cable and would have been damaged in the fall. Fish hook operation, which uses a majority of existing equipment, will save several hundred thousand dollars per test by saving the Polaris test vehicle from damage from fallback after launching. Zuni, an FJ-4 airplane armed with Zuni, the Navy's new five-inch ballistic rocket, recently tracked a drone target in a demonstration of the rocket's air-to-air -air capability. Zuni rockets equipped with continuous rod warheads were fired 3,000 feet from the target. The continuous rod warhead contains three sixteenth inch steel rods that are fastened together at the ends so they can expand into a steel circle 60 feet in diameter. Equipped with a proximity fuse, the warhead explodes near the target. The rod segments, traveling at a velocity of 4,700 feet per second, are lethal well beyond the maximum diameter. This is the Zuni kill in stop motion. Designed to kill aircraft structure, the continuous rod warhead has a high hit probability. Each cut in the target's wing marks a hit by one or more rod segments. The fuel tank was cut in half, and the tail assembly was severely damaged. The expanding circle of steel rods struck the midsection of the target and cut through more than 60% of the aircraft structure. The continuous rod warhead is capable of killing all known aircraft. Zuni rocket, again employing the continuous rod warhead, brought down a second target drone. Again, the rod severed the main fuselage, bringing the target down in flames. The high-performance Zuni rocket can be fired at ranges of 3,000 feet to 10,000 feet in any mode of attack. The combination Zuni rocket and continuous rod warhead gives Zuni an air-to-air -air capability, as well as its already recognized air-to-ground capability. You have seen some of the highlights of the Weapons Systems Program at Knott's, a government laboratory specializing in modern weapons which constantly keeps strengthening our Navy's arsenal.
next time on Pictures of Us. We had enough experience in various things that we weren't afraid to tackle anything. I cannot think of a prouder statement when asked what our occupation may be than to say, I serve the United States of America. <laughs>